Could people come in and, and fill in the front also? I know these are reserved for speakers, but I, I, I really want people to fill in. years later as president was like, well, what decade am I in? I worked with the World Wildlife Fund for, for 10 years. Did it in New Jersey. Yeah, it's, it's about... Um, well, I grew up... It's near Marstown. Marstown. It's right up... I went to Parsippany Hills High School, like from kind of no, <laughs> nowheresville in northern New Jersey, but... This is the third year that we've been running this campaign, right? And so every, we meant, we kind of built it around the Chuck Coffler Action Institute model. And three years ago, we ran it on, um, <laughs> on um, we focused on the U.S. Constitution, right? Last year, Susan Light was our headline person. We looked at U.S. diplomacy. Hi everyone. If you could if you could keep it down, I'm trying to have this conversation here. You're very yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, welcome back everyone. Yeah. And um, on my far right is uh, Bryn Mooser. 
And Bryn is an entrepreneur, he's a humanitarian, he's a filmmaker. In 2012, he co-founded Riot Media. Um, currently, he's the founder of another media company called XTR. Uh, early in his career, he went to Bennington College, which I was very unhappy with <laughs> because <laughs> this was the place that Bryn should have come. You got my sister. I got so you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Chelsea. And my mom. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That seems um, he then went off uh, to the Peace Corps in the Gambia. Um, and in 2010, July, or January 12th was the earthquake, and that brought him to Haiti. And so from his experience in Haiti, that's what inspired a long career of documentary filmmaking um, and uh, really experimentation with virtual reality and storytelling. Um, he's, won, uh, he's had two Oscar nominations. And all this is important, and, uh, but really his largest influence was me um, <laughs> as a 19-year-old um, um, when Bryn was probably 13, uh, me and my two esteemed colleagues, <laughs> Bill Skanga <laughs> and Jeremy Norton, would babysit Bryn um, <laughs> as, a, uh, as a seventh and eighth grader, <laughs> which is great. And I don't know who was doing the babysitting yeah, yeah, with yeah, the I people, I let's, I let's be honest. I, I would caution that as a parenting <laughs> technique in the future. <laughs> but and then Bryn you know, said he wanted to bring this woman up, and I said, yeah, okay, I guess so. And um, <laughs> so we're super happy to have Susan Sarandon as a, as a special guest. And Penny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, Penny. Penny. Oh, yeah. Penny's very used to this, apparently, has been on all kinds of stages, so <laughs> we're excited to have Penny. And um, Susan, I, I, I'm not going to try and go through her, um, her uh, filmography, but she's five Oscar nominees, one winner, um, uh, nine Golden Globe uh, nominations. Um, you know, Rocky Horror Picture Show had a huge impact on me. <laughs> when I was, when I, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, but more, more seriously and importantly, um, Dead Man Walking and um, Sister Helen Prejean. Um, and that film really turned the way we understand capital pun punishment. I mean, it really had an amazing impact on the way we under understand that. And so it's a perfect example of what we're trying to do with this, this whole week. So it made, um, it made excellent sense to have both here together. So thank you both for coming. Thank, thank you for having us. I'm only disappointed that I don't get one of those microphones. You know, that well, we're doing a song and dance later right, right. that we <laughs> will need our hands free. But the way I wanted to start is I wanted Bryn <laughs> to show his sizzle reel, you know, the reel that kind of goes through some of his work in the past to give, give you an idea of what his work is like. So Bryn, you want to take that away? Yes. Zach and I will do a team teamwork here. Sizzle. Sizzle. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this will serve as a good context for later, but to start off, I'd like to know, one, how you two know each other, mm -hmm. and, um, and then also what is your connection to this island that we all love so much? And could, could you start off there? I'll start with how we know each other. You yeah. can take the island. Um, 
<clears throat> First off, thank you so much for having me here. It's a huge honor, um, really exciting. It's been an amazing also week just to be on the island, which is just the most beautiful week, I think, in terms of weather. So thank you uh, for having me. Um, uh, Susan and I met in Haiti. Um, actually before the earthquake, I think was the first time that we went down to Haiti together. Wasn't it before? Um, uh, we were both working with an organization called Artists for Peace and Justice, um, and before the earthquake was helping to build elementary schools, working to support a community organizer and a priest down there, really an extraordinary person, Father Rick Frechette. And so um, went down with a group of, of actors and directors and artists um, including Susan and Josh Brolin and Diane Lane and a bunch of people I think who were interested in helping Haiti fell in love with Haiti um, and started working together to raise money for Haiti. Uh, after the earthquake then we worked really hard together um, both in fundraising and being on the ground there together um, and then since then um, have been lucky enough to work with Susan on a lot of issues uh, including uh, she introduced me to an extraordinary organization in Kathmandu in Nepal, which is what our next project that we worked on together um, that was around um, helping women with children in prison in Nepal. Um, and then we worked together after the earthquake in Nepal. Um, we did a little bit of work together at Standing Rock. Um, and then we worked together uh, in Greece um, telling stories around the beginning of sort of the refugee crisis um, as um, uh, migrants were coming into Lesbos, Greece. So that's what we've been working on and then gearing up, I suppose, for 2020. Well, yeah. <laughs> a lot of work to do. So that's how we started uh, working together, but then maybe I'll pass it to you about your connection to the island. I'm the oldest of nine children and uh, we started out in New York but ended up in New Jersey and our vacations were camping. But then as a bonus at the end of the camping trip, my dad, who always loved Maine, would bring the older kids, not me because I was the eldest so I stayed with my mother who was either pregnant or had just had a baby, uh, <laughs> back in New Jersey and he would take the three or four uh, older kids and would rent a place on Mount Desert. And eventually that little cabin uh, came up for sale and by that time I had just enough money to uh, buy it. I mean he came for many years, you know places don't turn over that fast and then eventually when it did, by that time I had a little bit of money and I, and I bought it. So then he, with the idea that he would retire here and so he, he kept coming and he eventually did retire here which was the end of his marriage because my, <laughs> my mother was <laughs> right. They probably would have killed each other if they'd been in a cabin on Mount Desert for the entire season. <laughs> but um, he, he lived here and worked as a guide at the park and you know the whole thing had a local TV thing which now seems like Portlandia or something because <laughs> it, he was so eccentric and would interview all the local people and we still have those videos. Les Tomlin was his name and um, somebody <laughs> knows, I mean, I, I, right, he was quite a guy and loved this place and so, and my brother actually came here to start high school uh. and worked locally and whatever and then eventually uh, moved and now is in Northampton, Massachusetts where he has a brewery and a restaurant. Um, and uh, so then um, people would come up and stay with my dad or whatever, but then after he passed, by this time it was starting to really um, fall apart and so I eventually uh, restored it and kind of updated it and now it's booked solid with my siblings and their children from the end of June through till mid-September and I managed to get a week uh, <laughs> now so it worked out just perfectly he said by the way are you going to be up in Maine anytime because I'm going to be there and I was like oh my god it's exactly when I'm going to be there <laughs> so I came with some friends and uh, we've just been blessed with the best weather ever yeah. and the water was actually warm mm -hmm. when I went swimming Wait, which, in the pond okay, in the pond okay. in the pond yeah. Right? Yeah. not yeah. in the ocean in long pond. I went swimming in the ocean two days ago which was not warm not at all, at all. Yeah. <laughs> but at all refreshing warm. nonetheless yeah. Bryn, I've got a, I got a question. So yep. in prep for this, I've watched a lot of the, the films that you've done. Not the VR stuff, but the, the traditional, what, if it's not VR, you call it? 
Yeah, which which go traditional. Oh, traditional, yeah. right, right. Um, and they go through, uh, so many of them, like they focus on a particular individual. Joseph, right, is, yeah, and uh, Lazarus, right? And, and so he tells stories through these individuals. Your most recent piece is also telling a story through an individual, and that is Steve Bannon, <laughs> like which I thought was very different from the other <laughs> characters. Could you... Could you build on that a little bit? Yeah. Oh, it was a tough setup. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'll start with the happy characters. Um, I think that uh, through my time in the Peace Corps, I was probably influenced that, um, lucky enough to spend a bunch of years in sub-Saharan Africa and then in Haiti, um, seeing a very different story than often um, you see kind of in the media. And that story was, uh, I think in the media, especially in the case of Haiti, was oftentimes, um, you know, challenges, riots, um, um, corruption. But actually on the ground, you're seeing more stories of hope, love, families, um, resilience, especially after the earthquake. And sure, there are many of those challenges and corruption, et cetera. But the ones that I think were moving me were those ones of, of hope and resilience. And so um, my time there, I think the early part of my documentary career in starting Riot was really wanting to try to capture some of those stories or that, that human story um, that I think actually has its roots. I just met another Peace Corps, re uh, returned Peace Corps volunteer here, but has its roots in the Peace Corps, which is, as Kennedy built the Peace Corps, it was really not about what you can go do in these communities, but then that story that you bring home and tell your community back home about what you learned, which is often this story of, well, you know, people are actually more similar to us than they are dissimilar. Yeah. Um, and so started, I think, trying to tell those stories, which is our first couple films in Haiti about uh, Joseph, who is the star of a little league baseball team, um, uh, but it was also the larger story of the cholera epidemic because his mother died of cholera. Um, uh, the first film we made in Haiti was um, uh, about building a movie theater in, a, in a one of the refugee camps, but told through the story of a guy who loved movies, Raphael. Um, and I think, and then Lazarus, which is a film that we just took to the Tribeca Film Festival, is about a musician uh, who has albinism in Malawi, uh, but he's also, um, you know, kind of becoming the voice of his people as he tells those stories. So I think at the beginning it was really about how do you capture these stories to really give people empathy or maybe to be able to put themselves in those shoes. And with Steve Bannon, um, we had a, 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 mu a friend of mine had worked for Steve Bannon for a number of years when he was a failed movie producer and had this uh, amazing access as a friend and wanted to actually tell Steve Bannon's story because she said, you know, he's not as scary, he's not the boogeyman. He's actually really quite a mess. Yeah. And if people would just see him as this mess, they wouldn't be so afraid and perhaps it would inspire people <laughs> that they could, you know, um, you know, do things to kind of knock these people out of power. So I, in that one, I don't know, maybe it's related in the sense that I wanted people to um, I think get a different perspective than the perspective that the media was doing. I think the media at that time was putting Steve Bannon as this like just frightening character. And if you see the film, which is available on iTunes, it's called The Brink. Um, uh, it was just came out of theaters. Uh, hopefully, we try to shine a light in the closet of the boogie monster, and you see it, and you know you realize this guy is just sort of kind of a bumbling fool, and there are Trump things that we Trump can do. Trump has just nominated him for the Nobel Peace Prize, so <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you did damage making right. him seem. <laughs> I just saw that today. Really? He's actually nominating him for 2020 oh. for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Susan. The other film I made <laughs> uh, uh, last year was a film about uh, a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, Nadia Murad. Yeah. That film is called On Her Shoulders. It's on PBS yeah. right now. It was shortlisted for the Oscar last year. Uh, but that film, if you have a chance, uh, tells the story of Nadia Murad, who was... Um, who's from the ethnic minority group, the Yazidis, escaped ISIS and became the lead witness in the International Criminal Court against ISIS. Her lawyer was Amal Clooney, so it brought a lot of attention to that story. Yeah. Maybe, maybe start with on her shoulders before <laughs> you yeah. move on to the brink. No, and, and Lazarus, Lazarus. Oh, yeah. I love that. I really, really loved it. And the Thank music, you. too, is... Doesn't he have... He has an album coming out in November, I think it is. Yeah, Lazarus yeah. was... Um, um, uh, it's a film, hopefully it'll be coming to a streaming platform soon, um, and it's been playing at film festivals all over the world. Um, you can see the trailer of it right now available online. Lazarus was, uh, uh, happened to be in Senegal with the band Mumford and & Sons, and they started passing around a video of a, a street busker 
with albinism, and they said, hey, this is some of the best music we've ever heard. We should go down and try to record an album. Um, nobody could find the money to make an album, but I could put together money to make a documentary. So the idea was really just, we'll go and make a documentary, but secretly record an album the whole time and yeah. put it under the guise of this documentary. So we made an album. Uh, Madonna came on as an executive producer who's been involved in Malawi for a long time, uh, and hopefully that film will be coming out soon. And the record comes out in September. Building on like the idea of character de development, I do want to ask you about Sister Helen and like so. What did you know? Bryn has one perspective of he's trying to tell a story through an individual. Um, how do you? How did you work with with Sister Helen to to tell that story? She's great. She's just the best. Um, well. You know, the death penalty is one of those things like abortion where everybody has very strong feelings, but it's not very specific why you have those feelings, right. but everybody has a knee-jerk reaction one way or the other. And I read Dead Man Walking, the book, and I just thought this is a love story, basically. It's about loving unconditionally, but it deals, the background of it is this question and the specifics of what actually happens and who is killed and why they're killed and what the state, you know, all of those things which nobody really, you know, it's very hard to kill people when you see them as humans. And so um, I think all the work that we do, the, stel the storytelling that we're talking about is, ju is just also an attempt to humanize people that are, uh, th that have become just concepts to people, which is such a violent thing to have happen. And so, um, I was doing the client, and so I was in New Orleans, and I had read the book, and I arranged to have uh, dinner, and um, she didn't know which one, uh, if I was Thelma or Louise, because she hadn't seen the movie, <laughs> but um, she said she was very relieved to find out that I was Louise and not Thelma, <laughs> and, uh, and then I got a good recommendation from Amnesty, because I had done some work with them, so we started talking, we had a great meal, you know, she's a big laugher. The thing that people don't understand is that so many people that are activists are so joyful. Mm. I mean, I, um, in all of these countries, whether, you know, when I went to Nicaragua in the 80s and, and um, they were at war and all these things were happening, but they were so joyful and the cultures are so strong in yep. Haiti and people still are so celebratory with their art and everything else and that's one of the things that really you know, I'm sure people think that I'm just the biggest Debbie Downer ever when they see me coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Sister Helen was just this great, great person. And so we just shook hands on a deal to have the book. Yeah. Mm. And um, that was it. And so then I spent the next year and a half trying to convince Tim Robbins to do it. And I finally had a breakdown on 7th Avenue and said I was going to give it to someone else if he didn't read it soon. And because and I just felt that this issue was so, yeah. was pressing. Yeah. And um, and he he did a brilliant job with the script, and so we uh, the book was as happens with books you you know we combined two people and it, he updated it from the electric chair to what to but the whole idea was to take a guilty person and kill them as humanely as possible and present both sides of the families of those that were and because she made mistakes with the families of those that the victims' families and whatever. She was such an interesting person because she didn't emerge, you know, knowing what she was doing. She was constantly just dragged in step by step. And I think it makes it much easier for people to watch because as she's, even when you hear her speak now, it's as if she's just figuring it out. She has a certain amount of wonder trying to understand you know, and that's what the film had to be, not a polemic. And I think that's why when we tell stories, we don't want to focus on telling people what to believe or how to act, but just giving them information they don't have and humanizing, t showing families, showing uh, the ups and downs of being in this situation and let people make up their minds. And so uh, I was r never expecting Dead Man Walking to make as much money as it did and to become nominated for five Academy Awards. We thought, well, you know, it'll just give, it'll go to video and at least it'll be a teaching tool, right. as many of my other films have. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it ended up, uh, you know, people 
bravely watched it because it's not an easy it's not an easy watch and so we've continued I mean we had a whole year and a half where she stayed with us when and I'm still very active with her and she's still very much a part of our family That's great um, I, I wrote down dangerous when humans become concepts that, that, that <laughs> struck me yeah um, if we can build on the character development one one step further Bryn for a while, you were very involved in virtual reality, right? And in my head, that is like taking an individual and p making them a character in something else. But why, why did you start the whole? Wh what was the inspiration behind doing virtual reality? And wh and where? Wh what do you think of it now? I s I saw. Um <coughs> I think at, at the beginning with Riot, we had built. The idea, the first idea of Riot when we were in Haiti was to build a news website where every story had a, an action. So the idea was as you were reading the news, you could do something about it, sign a petition, volunteer, and donate. And yeah. I in 2011, when we were first building that site, that was a pretty radical kind of idea. Like we, I, rem I remember as we launched the company at South by Southwest, like the audience was aghast in this idea that you could give somebody a solution when you were reading the news. Now I think it's, your, it, you know, times have changed a little bit, but. Um, but the wasn't the virtual, the thing that I did, the voiceover. Yeah. Was that, that was Haiti after the earthquake. No, that was Nepal. Oh, that was Nepal. Yeah. But we had done, um, but it was, it, but th that kind of concept that you could use a story to inspire action um, was really like at the root of, of my first company. And, and I think that um, to me, it always felt like news was, would depress people and anger them, but then there wasn't anything you could do, which was like, you know, if, if you could give them something to do, then um, you could take all of that emotion and kind of do something good with it. And so we were always trying to figure out how the best way we could use storytelling to inspire that action. And I saw an early virtual reality film in 2012 um, that was like a, a Paul McCartney concert. And um, it was pretty incredible to be able to feel like you were sitting on stage and it was a, a seat that no, no, it was access that you know a normal person could never get. And so I, th I thought that was a very interesting um, idea. And I thought, well, if you could use that in news um, or documentary, it could be a very powerful tool. Um, and it was at that time that virtual reality cameras were very expensive. They were about half a million dollars a piece. Yeah. Uh, and so I made my first virtual reality film just using a camera. Um, and I took a 360 photograph with I just took pictures of a, uh, a solitary confinement cell in, uh, in a prison and did a film uh, called Solitary uh, that went to the Tribeca Film Festival that people would put on a headset and they would be inside a cell. Yeah. And then we kind of had a voiceover talking about statistics. And then we had a story of a prisoner who had spent a decade inside solitary confinement. And, um, but it was just a photograph that you could kind of look around. Um, but it was there that somebody showed me a uh, prototype of a, of a virtual reality camera that was just a bunch of GoPros in a 3D printed case. And um, five GoPros in a 3D printed case. And that was very exciting for me because I had wanted to make virtual reality, but the camera technology hadn't been you know, affordable enough. So it happened that um, the next day, uh, I, sh I, got, I, I saw the camera at the Tribeca Film Festival when I was showing mine, and the next day was the earthquake in Nepal. Mm. And so my business partner at the time, David, um, was on his way to Kathmandu as a first responder. Um, and I called the guy who showed me the camera and said, can we borrow it and take it to Kathmandu? And so uh, it was a really crazy story, actually. It was, it, I, I called, the, the earthquake happened at like 9 AM. At d David said, I'm getting on a plane at 1 PM. This is David. David Darg. Darg. He said, I'm getting on a plane. So I kept calling this guy, Chadwick, who had the camera. Uh, and this was in New York after Tribeca, and he was sleeping. And so it was like 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m. He had gone out very late the night before, up until noon. And I finally had to go to his apartment, bang on the door, wake him up. It was noon. And he got out of camp. He was what's going on? And I said, we need to take this camera to Nepal. And so um, we got in a car, taxi, and met David at JFK and passed it over yeah. kind of the security. And David took that camera to Kathmandu and filmed what I think is probably the first ever virtual reality kind of news piece. Um, and then I thought, well, I think nobody's really gonna see this. Um, how can I get people to see it? Um, and I called Susan and I said, Susan, I think um, you know, you've been working in Nepal for many years 
and um, would love for you to be able to do lend your voice to this project, which I think people would then pay more attention to it if, it, if, if you're a part of it. And Susan said yes and recorded, you were on set somewhere, <laughs> and you recorded it, had the sound guy do a recording within an hour. I mean, it was really amazing. And um, so we put that, uh, her voiceover on the film, and then it just so happened the next weekend there was a film festival called Mountain Film in Telluride, uh, and I had a documentary that was playing there. So I called the programmer, this guy David Holbrook, and I said, we've just made a virtual reality film in, the, uh, in, in Nepal, and we want to show it in the film festival, and we have a couple headsets. And David had said, I would love to have you, but I don't know how to show virtual reality inside um, at the film festival. So David and I just brought two headsets. This was now a month after the earthquake. And we sat outside the theater at the, in Telluride, and we uh, put up a poster that we made called the Nepal Quake Project, and um, just put the headsets out. And within you know, 20 minutes, there was a line of people around the block. And in Telluride, uh, a lot of people, since it's a mountain town, had connections to Nepal or had been to Nepal or had been trekking through the Himalayas. So everybody had a connection there. And um, the film was about two and a half minutes long. And, when, and, and you were in the film, you were kind of standing on the, in the rubble. And it was very powerful because I think if you've spent time or people who have spent time in a, in a natural disaster, when you're, s when you're s immersed in it, it's a much more powerful experience than just seeing a photograph of it. Um, and people would take off the headsets crying. Most people were crying after um, seeing the film. And then they would ask, w you know, now that I'm moved, what can I do about it? And so I think um, for me, I just saw how powerful this medium could be that you could transport somebody, give them access in a way that they couldn't have access, you know, which is like it was nearly impossible to, 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 be, to have the experience of standing inside the streets of Kathmandu and not just seeing the photograph, but really understanding the scale of the disaster. Um, and so it was seeing that reaction, I think, that inspired David and I to start um, to say, well, listen, it, rather than shooting these kind of traditional documentaries, let's become you know, the, the leading virtual reality uh, documentary and nonfiction company. So after that time, we ended up shooting films for everybody from the New York Times. Uh, we did a piece around uh, a border issue um, on the, uh, uh, I think it was the Texas-Mexico border where a border patrol agent had shot through the fence uh, a young protester on the, other, a Mexican protester on the other side. We made a virtual reality film for the New York Times there. Did a lot of films for the Huffington Post with Susan around the uh, refugee crisis. Uh, worked with Reuters, Associated Press, et cetera. Really started to become the company that was making this kind of content. But it was just because at that point the cameras had become um, affordable enough that we could throw them in the backpack of all of our friends who are journalists or filmmakers all over the world. Susan, have you seen these? Have you worn the whole thing and <laughs> been inside? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I uh, have. And <laughs> and is Even old me, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I actually put them on. I've never, I've never seen but them. Well, <laughs> when I went to Lesbos, um, yeah. David brought something that looked like you would change the channel. I mean, it was like this big. Oh, a very small camera. So yeah. small, but I found that when, because my mission when I went, I just thought I'm going to go unattached to any organization and just try to find out who these people are, where I they left, where they left, and what their jobs were, just to bring it back and have some footage to um, kind of humanize again people, because at that time the rhetoric was like they were terrorists, yeah. these people that were drowning and everything. Anyway, but I found I couldn't hold it and talk to people, so it was easier for David, you know, for somebody else to be doing order. The guy that I, that um, Bryn, had, when I s decided to go over, I called him and said, do you know anybody that's been over there? I don't know where to stay or how to do it or anything, and I'm going by myself. And he hooked me up with this great kid that drove and, and Tyson and, and uh, took photographs and was the one holding <coughs> the channel changer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it is amazing because it's so small. Yeah. I was very interested at that time between uh, what virtual reality was captured it was a little camera like this, and so uh, Susan was meeting people and talking with people, but I was very interested in the time that if you were wearing the headset, you could not only see the person you were interviewing, the subject, but you could also see the reaction of the person who was doing the interview, too. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting idea that oftentimes you just see the subject, but you don't see the reaction of the journalist, too. Yeah. So we were doing that, and Susan would 
make the videos and we would get them uploaded on, on and published on Huffington Post the next day. Yeah. And this had never been done before because virtual reality up until then, like the Paul McCartney concert that I'd seen the year before took eight months and cost $2 million to make that film. Yeah. But now we were turning it around um, the same day on the other side of the world. So it was, I think it was a pretty radical project. W was this about the time when Google Cardboard started, c they started shipping that out? Is that about the? It was just before Google Cardboard, yeah. 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 So, um, oh, but you were asking what about virtual reality now? Well, that's what I'd like, I think with XTR, your, your new company, you've backed, you've backed off from it a yeah. little bit, right? And so, if it's so cool, why, why, why don't you keep doing it? What's, wha what's the decisions behind there? Well, I think we, we, we were very successful at becoming the, the goal was to become the leading you know, sort of news outlet that was doing virtual reality at the time. And um, we were successful at that goal and the Huffington Post, AOL, and Verizon ended up acquiring the company. So I sold the company to them. And the last three years I have run uh, Verizon's media arm, which is AOL, Yahoo, Tumblr, TechCrunch. I've run three parts of that business, the documentary part, virtual and augmented reality, and then their branded content division. Um, and for Verizon, which is about to un unroll uh, 5G across the country, 5G is gonna change a lot of things about how we consume content. So they were very interested in my team for their expertise in virtual reality. So. I just left in January. My new company, XTR, is all documentaries. I think that I was a little bit burnt out by virtual reality um, just because the, the challenge is it's very early, and so there, there aren't a lot of headsets out there. So it's sort of like all of this work that we were doing capturing these stories was ending up kind of like there's just not enough of an audience right now. Um, and funny also, if I'm going to go on The View and show a piece of something, it's got to be yeah. a little clip of, that's not virtual reality. Yeah, right? I think it, it, so uh, and the technology is still so isolating too, which is you putting on this headset and then, and I had a friend of mine who's an artist, a street artist, and I'd asked him, this is a couple of years ago, if he wanted to do a virtual, a big virtual reality art installation that we could do together. And he, he lives in LA with me and he said, you know, the problem is the headsets, there's not enough people who have the headsets. And he said, I know more people who own virtual reality companies than virtual reality headsets. <laughs> and it was so true. I also know more people who own virtual reality. Uh, so I took a break from it. I um, was happy to. But I still think it's a very powerful medium and immersive content in all of its formats is, is, is coming. Um, so it still has a place. Porn okay. will lead the way. Yeah, always. <laughs> <laughs> always. Everyone will. <laughs> So, Brit, I'm blushing now. I'm blushing, right, yeah, Me uh, too. Right, yeah. um, could you tell the audience a little bit about Lifeboat because um, that was extraordinary. And uh, what was, how did that come about for you? What, what's it about? <coughs> yeah, Lifeboat was a documentary that uh, we were nominated for uh, the Academy Award this past year. A short documentary directed by an, an amazing journalist and filmmaker named Sky Fitzgerald, who has spent the last uh, five years working um, uh, in the Mediterranean uh, around in and around the refugee crisis. And he had been working with a German nonprofit called Sea Watch. That's actually now a very Quite, quite, a, quite a controversial organization because they went from, as Susan was saying, kind of heroes in pulling people out of the water. They called them cowboys. They were like, some of the people were just like, oh, God, they're like cowboys. Yeah, they're cowboys. Yeah. Um, and they were definitely, you know, heroes. Th the, the, you know, the public really thought of them as heroes then and now. And did, it's didn't they, st I'm sorry, yeah. but didn't they start like hunting whaling ships also, wasn't that like a lot of the of guys, their origin? A lot of the guys came from Sea Shepherd and those other organizations like yeah. that. Um, but we're doing incredible work and the people, um, the people that were pulling out of the water, I mean, it was ho hopeless. And so uh, the, the documentary is, is inside, it's available on the New Yorker. You can Google Lifeboat in the New Yorker. Um, uh, but it was really on the boat of the Sea Watch as they um, helped pull people out of the water who were trying to come from Libya. Um, and uh, yeah, that was a film I think that um, was just also part of this uh, trying to humanize a little bit of what was going on. So in that film, uh, when you watch it, you, 
you meet people who are coming over on the boats who um, tell their stories. Um, I think, you know, hopefully for some people who watch it who, who haven't heard those stories before, they certainly, it opens up their minds that again, they're not all, you know, terrorists trying to come over to um, blow things up. And then uh, also you get a, a, a set inside the captain of the Sea Watch, uh, this guy, John Castle, um, who's a total hero, selfless hero. And so, um, yeah, I would say get a chance if you could find it at the New Yorker. Okay, so then the, I sent you this. The New yeah. York Times did a, a, a short video piece on it. And to me, it struck me because what they tried to show was, was their presence, was the sea, sea, what? Sea watch. Sea watch. Was the sea, sea watch's presence in the Mediterranean actually drawing more migrants than would have gone otherwise? Yeah. And I'm just dying to know what you, what you thought about that. Well, I also think that that's, there's been a big change in Italy, which is you know, sort of what I was talking about, where they were heroes five years ago, and now as they close the borders, it's, uh, you know, um, they're painting them more as part of the problem. I mean, Sea Watch would say that everybody's going to cross, no matter if they're there or not, and they may as well be there to help people. But um, certainly we say the same issues as people are helping on our own border, on our own southern border, yeah. um, as people saying, you know, should you get involved or not? The Sea Watch people would say we have to get involved. But the Italian government is trying to stop them and arresting many of them. Yeah. I mean, that's just another way to focus away from the fact that what's really happening in those countries. It's not an arbitrary decision to, to leave your culture, your language, your relatives, everything behind. People are leaving for very serious emergencies. I asked one woman, I said, how could you you know, you're getting on a boat with all, oh, so many children and pregnant women and newborns and, you know, and she said, well, imagine that you're in an apartment building and you live on the 10th floor and the building's on fire and you know if you stay, you'll die and if you jump, maybe there's a chance you'll survive and that's basically the scenario. Yeah. So pretending that someone decides, oh, maybe it's safer now, let's go, that's, that they're desperate, they're yeah. not going to, I mean, that's just a way of changing the focus to something else you can debate about the actual origins of what's going on in those countries that's leading to this yeah. situation. It's yeah. part of what we, t in the documentary to Honor Shoulders about Nadia Murad, that um, I if you get a chance to see that film on PBS, it's, um, you know, she, uh, her family was killed by ISIS. She was captured, was a sex slave. She escaped. Um, she just wanted to be a hairdresser in her community. Yeah. She wanted to open a hair salon. I mean, that was what her dream was, still her dream. Yeah. And she can't go back. And now she's a, won the Nobel Peace Prize, speaks all over the world, hates it. Yeah. You know, uh, just wants to go back and, and, be, a and be a hairdresser yeah. in her community, but knows that because she's one of the last survivors that she has to tell her story. And so the film is about her as a reluctant um, activist. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think if it was up to her, she would just have been in her village with her family. Yeah. The, the, um, when the EU started pressuring Greece when I was in Lesbos, the, I don't of course remember his name, someone with an enormous amount of consonants, but <laughs> he, you know, he <laughs> said he took, he took all these leaders of the EU out on a boat until they happened upon a boat, f and they're always triple the capacity, right? Yeah. And they, at that point, they were saying they could no longer pick up. They'd gotten rid of all the little rescue groups, the other cowboys, and they, and they were saying the Coast Guard had to do it, or the equivalent of the Coast Guard. And he said, okay. And now that they weren't allowed to pick them up, and they were turning them around and sending them back. And he said, all right, what do you want to do with these people? You know, now yeah. you tell me what to do with all yeah. these. Look at these children. Yeah. You tell me what I'm supposed to do with these people. Yeah. And the that was the end of the conversation. But when you don't actually humanize yeah. them. It's yeah. easy, c again, to just say, well, they shouldn't be leaving, or right, you know, right, we don't right. want them at our borders, yeah. or whatever. It, 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 the images of those boats that look to me about, you know, as wide as, as this tent, full of hun like uh, 50 to 100 people in the brutal sun of the Mediterranean, I mean, absolute desperation, right? And that film really captured that in a, in a really beautiful way, right? uh, difficult. And they all have stories that right. sometimes each they're in them, each right? yeah. country for so long before they even get on a boat. And we mm. found that most of, almost 90% of the um, life jackets that they were being sold were bogus. They, weren't, they wouldn't really float. 
Uh. They didn't help at all. They were fake. Uh. That whole mountain in oh Lesbos yeah. of jackets. Uh, that you know, Ai Weiwei did the piece of. Yeah, yeah, but David, you know, all those pictures yep. of me standing in front of ba basically mountains of these jackets that were discarded. Yeah. And, you know, also the people of Greece that just, in the especially, I, d I don't speak for all over, but this Lesbos itself just opened its doors and there were women, you know, collecting the clothes that they discarded and giving them new ones and taking them to be washed and cleaned and redistributed and shoes and, I mean, there was such a huge effort yeah. on people to try to help them. Yeah. And now their town is destroyed in terms of, uh, uh, you know, any kind of tourist yeah. trade is just yeah. like awful now. I overheard Bryn at dinner last night. So this is, uh, I, was, I was eavesdropping, but. Um, <laughs> Nervous. Yeah, yeah, no, at, at COA, yeah. like we've got loads of students who are art who, who want to be artists and are practicing artists we have loads of students who uh, actually love food and farming and food systems and what we tell especially especially both those groups like if you're gonna do that you better be a great entrepreneur in addition to being a really good farmer a really yeah. good artist like and um, I heard you say last night, Brennan, and I think it, it, it applies to both of you in a way, like you are, like those aren't mutually exclusive categories at all. So can you talk about how you think of yourself as, a, as an entrepreneur and, and doing humanitarian-based art at the same time? Yeah, I think uh, spending time like working with a lot of Nonprofits. I mean, in starting the Peace Corps and then working with nonprofits, and I'm sure everybody in this tent has experiences with nonprofits. Um, it can be incredibly difficult to work um, with nonprofits who aren't well funded, you know, where you're always fundraising, and then fundraising becomes the thing. And in Haiti, where you see such a great need, but everybody fighting over kind of scraps, I think I learned there that what I was, what I knew was if you could get scale, if you could grow things bigger, you could have a bigger impact. So, um, you know, it was a no-brainer to sell my company to Verizon because then I could help Verizon build out their $400 million a year philanthropy arm that they have. Um, and so I think that as a filmmaker, I want to be making as many films as I can. I want to be helping to make as many films as I can. And I think in doing so, I know that like you have to somehow reach scale. And in, 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 in my world, that's building a business that can grow um, and building a big business. I mean, I always want to dream as big as I can and not end up just sort of like in a nonprofit world of just scraping by and trying to put together projects. And so I think um, what we were talking about at dinner last night was sort of the difference between telling these stories as a, as a nonprofit and then, also, and then trying to tell these stories and how do you also build a business around them. Yeah. Um, and I'm much more interested in how you build a business because I think it, it allows you to do more. Um, certainly in my case, it allows, allows me to do more on that. So um, I think that's where the sort of that scale is. And I just think it's like, kind of depends on what you want to be spending your time on. Like I, I thought at the beginning I was, when I went off to Haiti that I was a director. The first film I made, I was a co-director on it. Um, but quickly I learned that I don't want to be a director, that actually my skill is a producer, that what I'm good at um, is finding resources for films. I'm good at identifying talent. I'm good at identifying when people have a great project that needs some, some extra help to get it uh, out the door. Lifeboat is a good example. The filmmaker Sky Fitzgerald made a beautiful film, um, but he came to me to say, hey, I made this awesome film. How do I get it seen by the world? Um, and what I was able to do with that film was help find a home for it and, and make sure it was at festivals and I, I think get it nominated for an Oscar and now it just was nominated for an Emmy as well. So that's kind of what my role is, is always being a little bit behind the scenes and helping to build up scale for it. Does that make sense? What about you? I mean, you're... Well, this, <laughs> is the, this is the... I mean, like if you can find a Bryn, that's amazing because there's so many well-intentioned groups that are doing, you know, helping people one at a time, educating kids. I work with a bunch of people that all, every year you're scraping together trying to keep them afloat. And 
it's very, very difficult because there's nobody there that knows how to structure it or how to reach out. And also the, there's the, the methods of fundraising are so outdated. The, you know, now the, this idea of putting on a gala, ah, yeah. you know, <laughs> should just, I almost have an allergic reaction just to the words. <laughs> and it, it takes so much time and so it's much, exhausting. and you make so little money and you're traveling to all these places. And I'm like, guys, we gotta rethink this. You gotta find some way to do something online or, I mean, and I don't, I'm not, my brain doesn't work that way, but it's enough that way to understand that this is this method is not working, and yet you know there, you're educating thousands of kids that wouldn't get an education. So how can you drop that? Right. You know, so you're trying to help in all these different. This, I mean, I nominated the gal from Nepal for the CNN Hero, and hmm. she won, and yeah. then she won like a, for the top. 10 hits and she won again. Yeah. I mean, like when we went there, I was like, oh, they're all so great, there shouldn't be a winner. Then she won, I was like, yes, <laughs> she won. <laughs> and she got $250,000 and that went toward the orphanage to build a permanent home. And then she won again, you yeah. know, and, and because of our documentary that we maybe were able to fundraise, even yeah. though it didn't get wide distribution or anything, we made another documentary that had to do, took place in a Palestinian camp and, and out of that also came a cookbook and now they've, we built a preschool based on that. So you see things one by one, but there's just, you, if you don't have some way to see the bigger picture, it just is so harrowing every year trying to make the budgets, which, you know, you think Beyonce could step in and save them all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Jay-Z, if only Jay-Z were here, he could pay for 10 years of this school, and uh, like that, you speaking know? Speaking of, do you <laughs> think um, you might Bring Beyonce or Jay Z to the <laughs> College of the Atlantic. I did do a video for Jay Z, but that's as far as our connection went. Okay. The yeah. B, I have not, no, okay. yeah. lately at all. We'll I met her on, once, we'll but work I'll on work on, on that. that. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing that we saw in uh, in Haiti was that Susan and I, the organization called Artists for Peace and Justice, which Susan is still incredibly involved in, had a bunch of people from all different parts of the industry, from uh, Ben Stiller to uh, Donna Karen to um, uh, you know Josh Brolin and all all, all of it. Demi Moore. I remember we went on the trip with Demi and all of these people. Um, as the guy, I was the person on the ground who was helping um, show everybody around and show everybody the projects. I was the country director who was there. And I think the thing that another great lesson that I learned in Haiti was that uh, a a every person who came in had a different superpower of how they could get involved and what they could do. And um, I spent a lot of time in those early days after the earthquake thinking about how everybody, how what, what could every single person individually do based on what you know they're good at. I remember we went down with Demi Moore that time and, um, and, and Josh Brolin, or no, Gerard Butler, who was a big strong guy, and uh, we needed to unload a, a shipping container full of rice. And so you could put Gerard Butler to work the whole day, and he did that whole, he was so happy to unload a whole, and he felt really good about himself, but Demi was, couldn't unload this b thing of rice, and so she, she had said to me, hey, I felt like I, I was helpless, like I, I came all the way to Haiti and I didn't do anything, and then I, I you know, said to Demi, like, you can have a dinner party at your place in New York and invite your 10 friends who are billionaires, and in one dinner party raise you know, more money than 100 shipping containers that Gerard Butler, that I could ever do. And so I think it really I, uh, sort of helped me understand best how everybody has an opportunity to help in their own way. And I think if you can really um, activate that, then you can do a lot of good but stuff and not everybody can do the same thing. But we're certainly <coughs> suffering from an enormous amount of burnout and fatigue of people, the same people being asked over and over yeah. to write checks or to, uh, go to these galas and to, you know, uh, and um, so I, th I think it's almost better to identify 10 people who could write a reasonable check and show them a tiny film and say this is what we're talking about and try to do it that way than to just, uh, I mean, really people are being hit whether it's, there's so much going on right now, we're in such a shift, yeah. I mean, it's undeniable not just in the United States, but all over the world, there's kind of a fight for the soul of everybody going on right now, and plus all these people that are suffering, and so you're just, it's, people become overwhelmed and then numb. Yeah. And so uh, when you tell a story, again, that can help people 
I think, decide that this speaks to them in some way, you know, because we do not have the luxury of depression at this point. We don't have the luxury of being uh, not engaged. And so it's, it's really who gets there and who tells that story. But in, if you find these little groups, like Artists for Peace and Justice is pretty small, or diff uh, the gal I work with in Nepal, um, Pushpa Basnet. Pushpa Basnet or Somali Mom, different people that have been doing it forever and ever. And even just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, that's what's so great about the smaller groups is that the bureaucracy, it's not like, I was a UN ambassador and it's not like the amount of bureaucracy you go through when, you, when you're going with a big uh, NGO, which is why I went to Lesbos by myself, um, even though they get uh, stuff done, but it's such a more complicated and a lot of the money disappears. Yeah. But when you're dealing with small groups, you know that you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. On, on, a, on a smaller thing. You know it's going there. They're not spending it on overhead, you know, for big salaries. And also groups that, uh, where the people that are being hired are from that country. That's important too, I think. Yeah. So we don't have a gala at the College of the Environment, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. And we are small by, by <laughs> design. Like, so All right. We're, we're on so I could talk forever, but I want to open it up to the audience. Are there, there are questions? Back. I'd like to follow up a little bit on the numbness and uh, overwhelm. What I find when I look at these documentaries and I get closer and closer to the human toll, uh, which is what is so incredibly affecting not only the AI stuff, but uh, smaller versions of documentaries such as the you know, Director for a Crime Death in Ivory Coast and the Blockbuster documentary, which go right to the point of this person is having shock and these are these are people suffering. I feel the love with that exhaustion and I don't I want to talk more about how we what you guys are doing like you're telling stories and we're receiving those stories and now even you're talking about looking for small groups that are doing the work. How do we So I'm just going to repeat the, yeah. the question. So oftentimes you see the documentaries, you feel numb, right? Bef and what do you do? And that reminds me probably of what Bryn was thinking when Riot was, was created. But the question is, what, what do you do um, in feeling so numb when you, when you move forward? How do you, how do you network with people? I, I think that's one of the most Im sort of important questions of our time right now. As Susan was saying, we're in this huge shifting moment where there are so many challenges that we face as a country, as a, as a global society, um, that h how do you make sure that you find ones that don't, o if, you, if you take on all of them, it can be quite overwhelming. Um, and so I don't know, I, I think sort of for me, it's always been back to that idea about kind of an individual approach, which is what are the passionate things that, that, what are the things that in your life are really passionate about that you want to dedicate a good part of your time and energy to that when uh, the gala is over, what are you still going to be saying, hey, I'm really concerned about this and here are the things that I can do about it. Here's, you know, a bake sale or I op to open my house to somebody or I host a dinner. The, all, thinking about all those things, but ultimately it's, I think it's very dangerous to kind of, you know, for all of us to take on every issue. And, um, but, it, but it ultimately is about finding issues that, that are very passionate and personal. And sometimes that might be about um, you know, s saving a certain kind of barnacle in Frenchman's Bay, or it might be about a refugee crisis um, off the coast of Libya. Both incredibly important. Well, I agree, and, and to, I mean, that's the secret. What is it that speaks to you, and you know, does it involve twinning with the class here? to send stuff there. I mean, very rarely does it involve going there because then there's just more people to worry about. So even though sometimes people say, oh, I really want to go to Nepal and work with Pushpa and the kids, uh, very, uh, that doesn't work all the time because yeah. it's, uh, again, just maybe you're in the way or, you know, whatever. Um, but in terms of finding producers, that is the question. I mean, even on 
films, producer is the least qualified job, usually on the entire film, <laughs> and there's so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so to find a producer that actually is savvy and gets the bigger picture and knows how to market, knows how to connect, and especially since um, there's so many platforms now, and mm. what Bryn is doing is he's, he's so up on all of these different platforms, and if you can match what your product is, and then find a way for people to be in touch with that on the right platform. That's really, imp really important. And so I think, you know, I don't know how you educate somebody to, to do that. Well, I remember when we were just at last point about that in, in when we were raising a lot of money and for Haiti and everybody was interested in how could they help Haiti. Um, I was living at the time in Venice Beach, which is like, you know, an incredibly affluent community in Los Angeles full of artists and am amazing people. And uh, somebody had said, a musician friend of mine said, oh, I want to uh, do an instrument drive. Do you have a music program at your school in Haiti, which we do, and a music school? Um, I said, but I'm, you know, I'm, I've got all these instruments and I want to give them to Haiti. And I said, well, you know, the Venice Elementary School has no musical instruments. They had <laughs> gutted their music department in Venice, which is in this incredibly affluent community. And I said, just go across the street <laughs> to the school. Like, we'll be okay in Haiti. We'll figure out how to get instruments. But that school across the street actually could really use, and uh, that person was a guy, this guy Carter Lay, who ended up building the music program at that school based on going over there and did a huge, he was well, the son of the guy who made Lay's potato chips and did an amazing thing at that school. And I was very proud, even though we redirected musical instruments from our school in Haiti, but um, actually the school across the street needed it just as much. Yeah. <laughs> Phil. Well, is that a target for you? How, how do you get the stories into the classroom? Yeah. Well, for instance, Dead Man Walking, Tim did a very clever thing. There's a play of Dead Man Walking. So in order to do the play of Dead Man Walking, which has been done in high schools and colleges, the requirement is that there be a, uh, a course on the book. So that means like an English course and maybe one other course. Could it be philosophy or law or whatever? So that, um, and maybe they see the film too, but in order to have the rights to do the play, they have to, uh, I you know, incorporate it into the other things. But I find that um, with the thing that we did uh, about the women in, in the Palestinian camp in Beirut, um, we, I went to the Vatican recently and, t and made some, did, did a little bit of cross-pollination there, but we asked people every time they do a screening, we'll give the film, but could they contribute to their fund, like two thousand dollars, so well, that's not very much, you know. F to and then they host a screening, and then out of that screening, people buy the cookbooks or whatever. So it's all, it's really grassroots, and I think it is very important to show it. And I know that Dead Man Walking has been very, very instrumental in getting the book in many, many languages, but also in 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 changing, it's, it's been shown to kids that are still like in high school or, or eighth grade kids and they really respond to it. And that's when you have to talk to them is when they're younger, absolutely. And then some of the, the, the documentary that was about um, uh, the rape of the woman on the bus in India, mm -hmm. it's called India's Daughters. The woman who did that documentary was so disturbed by the attitude of everybody even in India after that documentary came out that they were still blaming her even when the guys were sentenced to death. And so she did a study uh, that was also presented at the UN and, and, and came up with a whole teaching thing because all of these psychologists and soci sociologists and everything said that you have to intervene before the age of seven to get rid of these stereotypes. And so they put together a whole um, uh, classwork thing and books and everything that go into these schools early on all over the world and now they've just introduced it through the UN and the United States. So you're absolutely right, it has to, all of this stuff. And I think environmentally kids are much more, I mean in terms of damaging the environment, they seem to be much more aware now than certainly 10 years ago growing up, they're aware of environmental problems. Too bad they can't vote when they're that young. But they're <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Ha <laughs> ha.
<laughs> a virtual reality gala for College of the Atlantic. Yes. It's a good idea. <laughs> I think you could attach it to some kind of liquor deal so you could be drinking <laughs> <laughs> while you're watching. <laughs> okay. Yes. Thank you. The question yeah. is, that what are the best ways to engage with a film afterward? Uh, I think the most important thing um, that I always think about or I talk to filmmakers when we're working on it is what is your goal with the film, right? Like uh, that's the first question I ask. What's, what's the, um, the best possible outcome? Um, is it a policy uh, shift? Um, it, okay, if it's a policy shift, then like what we need is advocacy, and so let's get as many people to be tweeting, you know, some hashtag campaign or writing a politician, right? And so that's one track. Uh, is it a raising money because you're trying to build a library of a school or something? Um, then okay, let's go find the, you know, people who can make those donations and make that possible. So for me, it's it's the first question is always like, what what are we trying to do with this film? Because I think if if you know that before you start working on it, then I think you're that that's really going to be half, you're halfway there. I agree. Yeah. 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 Good. Thanks, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> Mary. The, the, that's a, uh, the question, I think, in its essence is how do you make uh, the message of a film, how do, you, how do you relay that in the curriculum of a, of a particular um, high school, college, elementary school? What's, what, where have you seen that work really well? Um, Susan? <laughs> Beyond, I mean, I think Dead Man Walking was a, a yeah. really good example of that. Well, of course, with Dead Man Walking, there was something that somebody wanted 
and then you have an end to making demands in terms of the curriculum. So I guess you'd have to find a way that there's something that somebody wants because people are just so slow to change unless they're forced, right? They, they're really, people are always trying to preserve the status quo. So uh, maybe, I don't know the school system in Ireland, but I, w and whether or not, uh, I mean, there's some schools that are m more open or liberal or progressive, whatever word you want to use, but maybe it's, it's also important to get data that supports a change. So if you were able to find a way to implement it in one, some schools and then you could show that it in some way had an effect, you'd, you'd probably be more likely to get it in other schools. And then of course the problem is who pays for it because people will al always say they can't afford it if it's not already established in a budget. So you'd have to have some kind of outside Funding. I'm not. I, I wish I knew more about Ireland. I don't know too much about the present day structure, except that in ter environmental, they s environmentally they seem to be well ahead of us. But um, uh, I don't know about the school system. But do you have any ideas on that? On how? Oh no, I was just going to say that sometimes it's like um, the amazing thing is sometimes it just t t it takes time and f and and. F think justice opens up, you know, I th think about like just in the time that I started Riot where you see what, how far we've come on, on gay marriage or, or, or legalization of marijuana or, or, or the steps that are being taken right now in criminal justice reform. You know, certainly we're taking many steps back in other places, but there's also, um, I'm, s I'm also um, uh, hopeful when I see progress when it unfolds just in, in terms of of time and history. Why don't we take one more question? Bo? So I've been thinking a lot about money and as we've been talking and it's a tricky thing for people to feel like they can have an impact when they don't have a lot of resources to offer and I, I just as a teacher and figuring out how to inspire young people so that they can believe that they can have an impact mm. on this world regardless whether they can be part of the Santoli Society or if you know what I mean. And I, I just, I mean film seems like it has the potential to be a, a really important tool but I guess coming back to that first question, you come, you know, when all is said and done, you're, you're in this place with people who may not, they may have a big heart and have great intentions, but they don't know what to do. And I believe that most people in this country, or at least more than half, <laughs> do think that things are atrocious and want them to be better. But is it, is it going to take what Puerto Rico did in two weeks? Mm -hmm. Or was that your answer to that uh -huh. one? <laughs> That's, right. That's exactly what it's going to take. People have to. T I mean, and and the young people are willing to do it, and the young people have done it, and all of the progressive or more interesting wins that we've had campaign-wise have all been with less money, no big money all with just shoes on the sidewalk and knocking on doors, but they need leaders and they need issues that inspire them with more than just fear. And that's where the hope comes in. And that's why they gravitate towards people who are authentic and who have a commitment to what is right. Uh, and, and by right, I don't mean politically, you know, I mean what you know in your heart of hearts needs to be done. And I'm, I just, all my hope is on the heads of, of the, the young people because they understand that it's them that it's going to be left holding this planet that's on fire. They understand that the Constitution is under attack. They, they're upset about their schoolmates being shot. They, they are out there. When I, I traveled with the Parkland kids and I dealt with some of the families there and and um, they're, they're committed, and they're committed in a, they're smart enough not to be in identity politics. They don't care what somebody's called. 
They just want the people whose voting record or who uh, connections are not the big money. And you know, we have seen in across the United States that people have won uh, the House of Representatives or have won these elections that are impossible to win against the machine with a third of the money. And that's because when you don't, when your donors are all big donors, you have no depth to your campaign. When your donors are all $27, $5, $10, you know, the important thing is that you talk to your neighbors, that you knock on doors, that you know what the issues are, that you know, and that's totally possible. And as a teacher, you know, I think that's, that's what's inspiring is to say, now we can look around and you can see that it is possible. It has happened. And you know, Citizens United was the worst thing that could have, could have happened. Forget about Russia. We've got the Koch brothers, you know, that are in there paying people. I, I mean, it's just not right the way that the balance goes towards big money. And I think people, you're right. No matter what you call yourself, you can see that things are off, and that people are suffering, and and people want to address that. And I and I think that. It, it is depressing to think that if you don't have money, you don't have a voice, but that's not true anymore. And there are people speaking specifically to that and saying, this is something that has to happen now. This is the election that means everything. And once it's over, you can't disengage. That, you know, this, was, this is a problem. People think it's just every now and then. You have to stay active in your communities, in your school. Those kids have and my nephew, who's not even old enough to vote in Florida, those kids have, have um, signed up so many people registered to vote, you know, 200 here, 250 there, and they will go to vote. You know, they definitely, they can't wait to vote. I don't remember seeing that. Even back in the 60s where people were very active, I don't remember people saying, I can't wait to vote. I, you know, I'm so excited. This is my first time voting. And let's just pray that there's not a lot of the stuff that went on in the last primary or in the last election so that they feel like this. Recently in Brooklyn, there was a run for DA, an, an, an upstart, again, with this amazing following, and then the machine woman, and they threw out 2,000 of her votes. It's down to a hand vote. Now imagine that you're one of the people that canvassed and knocked on doors and everything just to have the DNC throw out and it's down to 12 votes and they're hand counting. I mean, it's insane. So, you know, the people that they engaged that were so excited from Queens about being part of this and then went crazy on election night when their candidate won and now are told that, you know, it, they're looking at signatures and they're throwing things out and you're just like, oh my God. No, not just because she would be an amazing DA, but because of all those people that we're so engaged are now being told it doesn't matter. And that's what we have to fight against is to say, yes, you have a voice. Yes, you have to get engaged. Yes, you know, talk to your other classmates and, and things have to change. And that's the only way that it's going to change. Mike Trout. <laughs> Thank oh you. God. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan and Bryn. We're like really honored to have you Thank here you. at this the College fun. of the Atlantic. It was Thank great. you so much for coming. Tonight at five, Mbolo Mbue and Christina Baker Klein will be here. Five o'clock. Come on back, and we look forward to seeing you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Beautiful. That was fun. Yeah.